friends. Well, we live in a world of anger. There's no doubt about that. Everywhere you look, there is anger. And that's exactly the time in which Christ is going to return to the earth. We read in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 18 that the time of the raising of the dead that they should be judged is this time. The nations were angry and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward to thy servants, the prophets and unto the, to the saints and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth and the destruction of the earth. Of course, that particular Greek word in the original language of the New Testament, diaptero, means to rot thoroughly. We're living in a time when the world, of course, has corrupted itself, not only morally, but physically. It's physically corrupting the globe. So we, we sense that we're living in the days when our Lord Jesus Christ will return. And we want a good proof of that. We could do no better than to have a look at those first 13 verses of Ezekiel 38 that we've had read this evening. Because there's not one thing in those 13 verses that is not already either in place as required or is actually happening. We couldn't have said that even five years ago. We can say it today. And so we're going to go through tonight very quickly, obviously. Time will permit us only to do a little bit of this on each of the elements of, of Ezekiel 38 verses 1 to 13. But we're going to step through that and find that everything there is either in place or on the move. Now, that is very, very significant indeed. So what does Ezekiel 38 require? Let's stand back and have a look at those 13 verses. It requires a dictator to dominate the Eurasian continent. We have one. Whether he's the man described as go, time will tell, but we have one. The very characteristics that are required by Ezekiel 38 verse 2 are in the man Vladimir Putin. It requires in verses 5 to 6 that the territory east and north of Israel be under Gogian control. In verse 6 that a dependent Europe will fall under Gog's political control. In verse 8 that the West Bank would be part of Israel proper and not a Palestinian state. It requires in verses 8 to 11 that Israel would be at peace internally and with its near neighbours, something that hasn't been in existence, of course, for a long, long time. It also requires in verse 12 that Israel be very prosperous and be envied by those round about. It requires Yemen, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states to be the, the first to oppose the Gogian invasion of the land, which tells us that they're going to be very close allies of the nation of Israel. Former enemies have become close allies, the first to complain. They're the first ones mentioned in verse 13. And that requires Britain and the young lions, that is those who owe their existence to British colonisation, who have a British form of government, to be there, to follow suit. So there's our first 13 verses. So we're going to start, of course, with verse 2 of Ezekiel 38. We're looking at the dictator that is described here. And Gog, of course, is a title, according to the English and Hebrew Bible students' concordance, Gog means the one at the top. He's talking about a dictator who has absolute control. He has, of course, what they call in Russia today the vertical of power, like a czar. The czar was the lawmaker. His word was law. Nobody else had a say. One man who sits at the top. Well, we have one, don't we? His, his name is Vladimir Putin. Now, of course, under the Russian constitution, he has to stand down in 2024. Well, he's not going to stand down in 2024. I'm going to show you a series of articles drawn from from the last year or two to show and demonstrate that what's required by these 13 verses is actually happening before our very eyes. Some of it already in place. They're going to scrap. Ultimately, they're going to scrap the constitutional requirement that a Russian president can only stand for two terms, like that, of course, in America. They are going to remove that law so that he can actually stand again uh, in 2024. And, of course, he will obviously win. But there's something even more important that's happening in the Russian Duma, the parliament, right now. It, of course, is in this little article. I want to highlight these words out of the article. There's a push to make Putin a czar. A group of pro-Kremlin activists has a different idea. Proclaim him Tsar Vladimir, they say. We will do everything possible to make sure Putin stays in power as long as possible. Now, this is not coming from a corner of Russia. 
This is coming from the members of the Russian Orthodox Church, who of course are fully behind Putin, from members of the country's top political parties, from members of the business community and the oligarchs. They all want to make Vladimir Putin a czar. Well, that's very interesting because Brother John Thomas, way back in 1848, wrote in Ilpus Israel, page 432, he said, at some time hereafter, and that not far off, a czar of Russia will be both emperor of Germany and autocrat of all the Russias. He might prove to be more accurate than, than we initially thought because they want to make Vladimir Putin the czar of Russia. Now, of course, there's something else that Putin has been doing in recent years. It's also highly significant here because when you read Ezekiel 38 verse 2, it says this, set thy face against Gog, this is the one at the top, the man who has this vertical of power, the dictator, of the land of Magog. That's how it should read. In other words, his origin is of the land of Magog. Now, Magog, so historians say, is this area here. This red uh, circle is the area of the ancient land of Magog. What's the largest country there? Well, the largest country there, of course, is the Ukraine. And the Ukraine is highly important to Vladimir Putin because his objective is to rebuild the Russian Empire. And you can't have an empire rebuilt without its original homeland. And when the Rus established their kingdom in the 900 ADs, in 989 AD, they actually made Kiev the first capital of the Russian Empire. Now we understand why Putin has spent so much time and effort to try and take control of the Ukraine, because it is the original heartland of the kingdom of the Rus, who are mentioned here in Ezekiel 38 and verse 2. He is prince of Rosh, Rus, Rosh, Russia, Meshach and Tubal. So again, there's a significant thing going on here. Now, of course, we know that his intentions are very clear. There was a defector recently. Uh, this is in March 2019. There was a defector, a former tank commander defected for love, and this is what she said. She brings word of Russian plans for a massive invasion of the Ukraine. There's no question about that. That's what he's going to do. And when he gets that territory of the Ukraine, we will have Gog of the land of Magog. That will be another wonderful fulfilment of Bible prophecy. Let's move on to Putin and Turkey. As I said, you're not going to get too much on each of these verses because we simply won't get through the 13 verses if that's the case. We can't do more than a few minutes. So let's move on to Putin and Turkey because it's very important what is happening there. You might recall on the 24th of November 2015, the Turks shot down a Russian jet over the border between Turkey and Syria. Remember that? Well, within a week, there was a letter on Erdogan's desk demanding the return of the Hagia Sophia the most important building in Istanbul, the ancient Constantinople, demanding the return of the Hagia Sophia. There was a lot of problems between Turkey and Russia. The borders were closed, the trades were, trade was cut off, etc. But in the last 18 months, Putin has changed his entire approach to Turkey. Now, why would he do that? Well, he does it, of course, because Turkey is a member of NATO and he's trying to undermine NATO. And Turkey wants to be a member of the European Union, and the European Union doesn't want Turkey because they're basically Muslim. So they've got a problem, and he is using it, he's undermining uh, the Turks by his new approach. His approach now is to, to lure his counterpart here, Erdogan, the leader of Turkey, away from Europe and away from the US. And you might recall that the US made an agreement because Turkey has been an ally, part of NATO, been an ally, they were promised that they would receive the new fighter jet, the F-35 or whatever it's called. Well, that's now been withdrawn because Putin offered the Turks the S-400 anti-aircraft missile and they're totally, of course, uh, opposite things. So here we've got a, a game going on. So why this switch of behaviour from Vladimir Putin, who tends to be fairly bullish, why does he take this approach in Turkey? Well, we're told. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25, we read this because in this prophecy of Daniel 8, the Russians are going to take over what used to be called Constantinople. It's going to become the eastern leg of Nebuchadnezzar's image. 
And we read of the behaviour of the power that takes over this place through his policy or so he shall cause craft, Brother Thomas says priestcraft, to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. And that's the tactic that Putin is using now, both in Turkey, in Syria and so on. So Erdogan has made a serious mistake here in recent days because on, at the end of March this year, he decided that he would make a declaration that he was going to turn Istanbul's Hagia Sophia into a mosque rather than a museum, which it is today. Now, that's not going to go down well with Vladimir Putin because the Russian Orthodox Church that is strongly behind Putin uh, demands the return of the Hagia Sophia. It's an, as important to the Russian Orthodox Church uh, as the Vatican is to the Catholics. That's how important that building is. So he's made a very serious mistake. Let's move on a little bit further. What about Syria to the south of Turkey? Russian control from Syria to Pakistan is required before Armageddon. And there are three Bible prophecies that speak eloquently about that. I want to show you very briefly those three prophecies. They are Ezekiel 38 verse 5, Daniel 7 verse 7, and Daniel 11 verse 40. They all say the same thing, that Russia is going to have political, military control of the region from Syria to Pakistan. Now, give me a chance to do this in about five minutes. It should be half an hour. Give me five minutes and we'll see what we can do with it. So control of Syria and Iraq will mean possession of the territory of ancient Assyria by the so-called, in prophecy, latter-day Assyrian. That's what the Russian gogs called when they come down upon the land. They are the latter-day Assyrian. Isaiah, Micah is full of prophecies about that. Okay, so that's the first thing that will be acquired, the territory of ancient Assyria. And control from Syria to the Indus River will mean possession of the Seleucid kingdom of old, called in Daniel chapter 11, the king of the north. So let's have a look at this. Now, we're in Ezekiel. Let's have a look at verse 5. What's the first name of the first confederate listed here? Persia. Now, when you read Persia, what do you think of? Do you think of Iran? Well, yes, it includes Iran. But go and have a look at some ancient maps. When the kingdom of Babylon was the superior kingdom, between the, the year 606 to 539 BC, this was the Median Empire. And this map will tell you that in 625 to 550 BC, this was the territory owned by the Medes, who of course ultimately became the Persians. We had the Medo-Persian Empire. They were no small power to the north and the east of the power of Babylon. So that's the first thing. So when you read Persia, don't read Iran. Read that entire region. So where does it go from? Syria, Turkey, right across to the Indus River. That was the kingdom at the time when Ezekiel wrote in 600 BC, circa 600 BC. So that's the first reference. Now, is that supported by other references? Well, yes, it is. Come, to, come with me to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. Now, Daniel 7, of course, lists the four world empires in a slightly different form to that which we read in Daniel chapter 2. What we have in Daniel chapter 7 are four beasts. Now the fourth beast represents the Roman Empire. So we read in verse 7, after this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Now iron of course is the identifier of the Roman Empire. That was their symbol, certainly in scripture. And then it says this, it, break, it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. That's never happened in the history of the Roman Empire. Never did that happen. I want to point out to you what that residue is. It goes on to talk about the Roman Empire, diverse from the beast that were before it had 10 horns because it was broken up by barbarian invasions. So I would normally show you a series of maps of the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian and the Grecian, and then the Roman. What I have here, of course, is the Grecian. 
And the reason it's there is because, you see, the residue that we're talking about here is that territory. In their entire history, the Romans, they did get, very briefly, to the head of the Persian Gulf, but the Parthians were too strong. And in 118 AD, Hadrian withdrew from the conquest of Trajan, his predecessor. He withdrew and he built a line of forts down through Syria and Jordan, and I've stood in a few of them, so I know they're there. And this was the eastern boundary of the Roman Empire for the rest of its history. They never got anywhere near the Indus River, where the Persians had ruled to, and where, where Alexander the Great had conquered. They never got anywhere near it. They were never in possession of this territory here. Now, that's very interesting because, you see, that's the residue, the residue of the previous empire. So when the Medo-Persians came along, they gobbled up the Babylonian territory. When the Grecians came along, they gobbled up all the territory of the, of the Medo-Persians. When the Romans came along, they didn't. They did not conquer the territory to the east of Israel in any measure. It's the residue. And that residue has to be stamped with the feet, which of course means troops on the ground. This means military action. Now you'll be aware, of course, that there's a few things going on in that region right now, that there's a few problems, that Iran is flexing its muscles against uh, not only American, but Saudi Arabian and Gulf states interventions, and there looks like there's going to be some kind of trouble. Yeah, well, there will be. We don't know exactly how that will pan out, and what we do know is the outcome. Now come with me to Daniel chapter 11. This is the third reference. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push out him. We believe that's fulfilled. The king of the south was the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt, down here. And what we have is the time of the end. So this is not about ancient history, it's about modern history. It's about what happened in our era of time. Well, the British were in control of Egypt from 1882 to 1954. And in that period of time, there was the First World War. And the British used Egypt as the military base to push the Turks out of the land of Palestine so that the state of Israel could be created in 1948. You see, God was at work. So that's what the early part of verse 40 is about. Now, how do we know that? Well, it says the king of the south shall push at him. So who's the him? Well, your context will tell you who the him is. If you have a look at verses 36 to 39, you will find that there's a king referred to. And that king is the same king that occupies Constantinople in Daniel chapter 8. Okay, so... It's the ruling power of Constantinople. Well, who was the ruling power of Constantinople, or Istanbul as they call it today, during the First World War? The Turks. And the British as a foreign occupier, which is what you have to be. To be called either the King of the South or the King of the North, you have to be a foreign occupying power of the territory of the ancient kingdoms of the Greek Empire when it was broken up and given over to the four generals of Alexander. And these were the two most prominent, the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt. Well, what about the next part of verse 40? It says this, and the king of the north. So who's the king of the north? A foreign occupying power of the Seleucid kingdom, that green part of our map, which just happens to be the residue of Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. This area of territory has to be taken over by a foreign power who will then push or at least come against, like a whirlwind, come against the him. See there it says in verse 40, and the king of the north shall come against him. So who's the him? Same him, verses 36 to 39, the power occupying Constantinople. Well, who's that today? Well, it's the same power, isn't it? The Turks. So what we have here is a prophecy that is still yet to come to pass. So the first part, part A of verse 40, is fulfilled. The second part, part B, is not fulfilled, but it's about to be fulfilled. And when Russia takes control of this territory from Syria, which is why they're there, when they take control of the territory from Syria across to Pakistan, we will have our king of the north. 
And then they can do what this verse requires. What's that? Take Constantinople. Okay? You can't do that until you become the king of the north. And to be the king of the north, you've got, got to be a foreign occupying power of the ancient Seleucid territory. Once they have, of course, control, once the Russians have got control of Constantinople, it is to be used as the base of their invasion of the Middle East, coming down through Israel and into Egypt, to be drawn back to Jerusalem to be destroyed by the intervention of Christ and those that are with him at that time. Now, is this understood by Christadelphians? Well, of course it is. Brother Maurice Stewart wrote this in his notes on the prophecy of Daniel, published in August 1973. Don't look for this in the Australian publication of those notes, because you won't find it. I can give you a copy of the North American version, and you will find these words. He understood this. Let us emphasise, he says, about Daniel 7, verse 7. He's talking about that residue. Here is an important statement that has, has not as yet been fulfilled. Rome has never trampled the residue of Persia underfoot. It has never occupied all this territory. A power must yet arise which will occupy the territories of Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome to be afterwards subjected to a higher power, namely Jesus Christ. And then he says this, Russia will do this. Thus, like the image of Daniel chapter 2, whose metals will have to be confederated together before they can be broken to pieces together, so also this terrible fourth beast vision has a latter day application. Now, I hope that that makes a bit of sense because that's all you're going to get on those three passages. But when you put those three passages together, they're eloquent. They tell us that what we're actually seeing happening right now is the precursor to a Russian control. They'll put their own people in power, just like the ancient times when, when Alexander came through, he would leave the, the rulers of the day basically in power if they were prepared to be subjected to him. It's going to happen again, but Russia will have military control from Syria to Pakistan, and then, then they can take Istanbul or Constantinople and use it as the base of their operations in the Middle East. Let's move on to another couple of things that come out of Ezekiel 38. So we can step back here to Ezekiel chapter 38. <clears throat> we read this <clears throat> in Ezekiel 38 verse 5. What's the next name mentioned after Persia? It's Ethiopia. The word, of course, Ethiopia is not a very good translation of the original. The, the Hebrew word that is used here is Cush, the Cushites, okay? Now, there are three Cushes in the Bible, three places called Cush, and here they are. The original Cush is in Genesis chapter 2. It's the area around Babylon. That was the original Cush. Then there's the Cush of Numbers 12 verse 1, because Moses' wife, Zipporah, was called an Ethiopian, a Cushite. So it's a little mini Cush, as it were. And then we've got the Cush of Acts chapter 8, the so-called Ethiopian eunuch who's, of course, converted by Philip. So there are three places called Cush in the Word of God. And it's this third one that is being referred to here in Ezekiel 38, verse 5. You know what the modern Cush is? It's Sudan. Have you heard about things happening in Sudan recently? Yeah, Bashir overthrown, people demanding democracy. You reckon they're going to get it? Well, even if they do, this is what they'll get. No matter how the new government... So this is the Moscow Times... Okay, April this year. No matter how the new government is configured, there is no doubt that they will seek cooperation with Russia in the near future. Yes, even Bashir allowed the Russians, because he went to Moscow to seek help against the Americans. He asked the Russians to protect him against the Americans. And Putin said, yeah, we'll do that, providing you allow me to build a naval base in the Red Sea and to put some troops in Sudan. Yeah, we'll do that. And of course, Russia will play a part there. There's no question about that. Isn't that interesting? The very first two names, Cush, Cush of Ethiopia, preceded by Persia, and we can see who they represent, and there are things actually happening. Well, what about the next one in verse 5? And Libya. You know what's happening in Libya? Well, of course, we know what happened there. The Libyan dictator, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi was overthrown in the 2011 Arab Spring Civil War. 
And a former ally of Gaddafi, Field Marshal Khalifa Haftar, heads the Libyan National Army and controls eastern Libya and is supported by Russia. He's been there twice. He's worn the carpet out in Moscow, seeking help from Putin against his enemies in Libya. He's visited Moscow to seek that help, and Russia, last year, actually landed troops on the Egyptian border, not the Libyan border, the Egyptian border next door to support Haftar. And recently, of course, he's brought his forces to Tripoli and uh, try to overthrow the recognised, internationally recognised government of Libya. Well, things are happening in Libya as well. We know where that's going to end up. Libya will become a strong ally of Russia, whether it's Haftar or someone else they will become an ally of Russia. Well, let's move on. What's the next one? Read on with me in Ezekiel 38, verse 6. Goma. Now, we'll come to Goma in due time, because it's actually a reference to Western Europe, particularly France, and all his bands. The house of Tagama. This is what I want to focus on for a second. Who's Tagama? Well, Tagama is actually a reference to Armenia. Point that out in a minute. Now, this is what's happening in Armenia. They've got a new president the last couple of years. The previous president was in the pocket of Vladimir Putin. He was sending weapons there, ancient weapons from Russia. He was very strongly allied to the, the previous... And now he's built a relationship with the new president of Armenia. Now, this is interesting because Ezekiel 38, verse 6, talks about this house. Notice the language. House of Tagama of the North Quarters. Well, here is the history of Armenia. There was a Turkish genocide of the Armenian race between 1915 and 1922. One and a half million Armenians were, were killed, many of them driven out into the wilderness to perish from thirst and hunger. And their territory, they used to have what's called the Little Armenia here. We, it's called Cilicia in the scripture. And this was the historic, see that red border? That was the historic Armenia. And 80% of their territory was stolen from them by the Turks. Guess who's been there recently, 2016? The Pope, yeah. And he said that the Turks committed genocide against the Armenians. He implied that they should get their territory back. There's no question that Vladimir Putin believes that. And so the time will come when Armenia will, will have some kind of restoration. So why are they called a house, do you think? Well, because their nation was decimated. And what we have now is Armenians all over the place. There's Armenians in Turkey, there's Armenians in Syria, there's Armenians all over the place. They're a house. They're not really a nation anymore. All that remains of Armenia today is this little pocket in the red. That's it. So we've got things happening there as well. It won't be long. And Armenia will get back some of its territory when, of course, Russia does its business in Turkey. Well, that's about all I'm going to say about the Middle East until I come back to Israel and its close allies at the time of Armageddon. I want to move on to something that is of great interest to anybody who loves Bible prophecy, the things that are happening between Britain and Europe right now. Let's talk briefly about Brexit, shall we? And Brexit's effect on the European Union in particular. Now, this is a cartoonist depiction of what's happening. These words, by the way, are mine, so this is the cartoon. He's got Britain walking off the plant. Won't be long, there'll be others who walk off because in Italy, the Netherlands, Austria, in Greece, in France, and even in Germany, there are now strong movements for those nations to depart from the European Union. So Britain's just the first. And, of course, it won't be long when there will be others who follow suit. So the UK was scheduled to leave the European Union on the 29th of March. And, of course, I don't need to tell you what's happened. Uh, Theresa May, no longer Prime Minister, temporary-type Prime Minister at the moment, they'll get a new Prime Minister, one of two. One of them is Boris Johnson, who says that, regardless, Britain is going to leave the European Union on the 31st of October this year. The other one says he's going to go and achieve what Theresa May could not achieve. He's going to go back to the European Union and renegotiate the deal. Well, they're going to kick him out. If he becomes Prime Minister, he'll be kicked out. But I want to show you something very important about history in relation to Europe and Britain. So there's a delay going on right now. This deal that was approved 
by the European Union, conditional on Westminster's support for Theresa May's deal, of course is now in the balance. But these are the words I wanted to focus on. If that doesn't happen, and this is said by Jean-Claude Juncker, right, he's one of the leaders of the European Union, he said the European Union had done much to accommodate Britain and could go no further. If that doesn't happen, he says, they don't leave under this particular deal, and if Great Britain does not leave at the end of March, then we are, I'm sorry to say, in the hands of God. Well, he's right. They are in the hands of God. And the angels are working right now, of course, to make sure that we, they get the right Prime Minister to do the job. So let's have a look at what the scripture says. The image of Nebuchadnezzar, of course, has two legs, the vision of the Roman Empire, and we've got the feet. Now, the feet have not yet actually been formed. They're in the process of being formed right now. But this is the history. The barbarians broke up the Roman Empire. In 420 AD, the Roman Empire was finally resolved into two legs, with an emperor in Rome and another in Constantinople. The Roman Empire withdrew from Britain in 410 AD. That's 10 years before we've got the final establishment of the two legs of Nebuchadnezzar's image in Daniel chapter 2. The feet with the ten toes, the confederation of southern European states, united for a time by Gog. It's a brittle fusion. We read that this iron and clay don't stick together very well. You can't put autocracy and democracy together. It just doesn't work, but they'll make it work for the time being for their objective to be achieved. So it's a brittle fusion of democracy and false religion held together by humanism. So that's what's happened in history. It's very interesting because when you look at what happened when the Romans departed from Britain, so here it is, the departure dates. Now, it's probably hard to read from the back. Let me read them out to you. 383, the final departure from the west and the north. 401, final departure from Hadrian's Wall. 407, final departure from the southeast. That's where London is. 409, expulsion of Roman magistrates from the cities. The game was up. And so the Western Emperor Honorius said, well, we're getting out. So there was what they call the rescript of Honorius. The Romans came out of Britain. It was not Britain that came out of Rome. Get it? So it doesn't depend on what the British do. It depends historically because history is often repeated. It depends on what the Europeans do. And the Europeans have already made it quite clear. No change to the agreement that they made with Theresa May. You take it or you leave it. What's that going to mean on the 31st of October this year, do you think? Well, it doesn't matter who the Prime Minister is. What that's going to mean is that Britain will be out because the Europeans will basically kick them out. And that's what happened in history. The Romans left Britain. It was not Britain that left Rome. So if history is to be repeated, that's what's going to happen. Now, Brother Thomas says this in the exposition of Daniel, page 76, that Britain is not part of the image empire. The premises now before us also establish the position that as Nebuchadnezzar's image is representative of the Gogian empire in full manifestation, it is impossible in the nature of things that Britain can be one of the ten toes. And as the toes of the image represent the same powers as the ten horns of the fourth beast and of the dragon, at the ten horn apocalyptic beasts, neither can she be included among the powers prefigured by those symbols. So there's no question about where Christadelphians have stood on that matter. So what does prophecy require then about Europe? Well, it's pretty clear. We just made mention of those ten toes of the image and the ten horns on the beast of Revelation chapter 17. We read in Revelation 17 verses 12 and 13, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no power as yet, but received power one hour with the beast. They have one mind, they shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So what we're reading is that there will be ten independent nations with one political agenda shaped and guided by the papal system. At that time, he will have great power in Europe, and that we believe that will come on the back of the Great Depression that will soon descend upon the earth. So the European Union and the Eurozone, as we know it, the 28, 27, 28 nations, is doomed. 
British withdrawal and the bankruptcy of most of the southern states of Europe will ultimately see the northern uh, parts of that union depart for self-preservation. So here's the Roman Empire of old. This is a huge empire, as I said, it went over to here, remember? They got over here briefly, then they came, this was the, the, the eastern border of the empire. Most of it was focused here in the Mediterranean region. And this was the area that was broken up by the barbarian invasions in the late 300 ADs for the next 100 years or so, and 10 nations, at least 10 nations, were formed on the body of the Roman Empire south of the Rhine and of the Danube. And that's how it will be in the latter days. How will it come about? As I said, the world knows, and the experts are saying it's going to happen either in 2019 or 2020. We'll have to wait and see what God's state is. But they're saying that there's going to be a great depression that will descend upon the earth. And of course, the combat between China and the US over trade is not helping things, is it? How's your job going, brethren? All right, there are people be beginning to get worried because business is slowing down, house building slowing down. It, people know there's trouble on the horizon. Yeah, and it's coming. That Great Depression will finish the job. It will ruin the European Union. It will see these bankrupt southern states, and most of them are bankrupt already. It will see them having to hide for help to another power who happens to have some money. He lives in the Vatican. All right, he happens to have some money. And he will want some kind of influence in the politics of Europe as the quid pro quo. He's going to get enormous power. And we will have what the Bible requires, the revival of the beast of the sea of Revelation 13, the fourth beast of Daniel 7 verse 7, which has to be there to be destroyed by Christ, and the Babylon the Great of Revelation chapter 17. I'm watching the clock. I know what time it is. Now, that's all I'm going to say about the European. I want to finish tonight on the really important thing for Christadelphians. What's going on in Israel and with the nations around Israel? You know, I mentioned at the beginning that Israel has to be very prosperous at the time of Armageddon. Read verse 12 of Ezekiel 38 with me. Gog comes to a land at peace, we're told in verse 11, at rest. They've taken down the walls and the bars and the gates. And they come to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn their hand upon desolate places. And as you read on in that verse, it's talking about the prosperity of Israel at the time of Armageddon, the Russian invasion of the land. Okay? So where's Israel today in relation to other nations when it comes to prosperity? Well, they're number three on the NASDAQ. All right? Number three on the NASDAQ, which is the index that tells you what people are prepared to put into supporting businesses in the nation. So the US, China, Israel, okay, so they're pretty high. They are regarded, and yet you can get on the internet and you can see Netanyahu's speech in the UN last year and the one he was supposed to make this year, and you'll see he was boasting about Israel's prosperity, and he's right. Israel is right up there in relation to prosperity, and it's going to get better because they'll come through the Great Depression better than most nations on earth. They will be very prosperous and they will be envied by other nations at the time of Armageddon. But they're going to have some allies, some very important allies. So let's start with this map. This is the Muslim world. The blue is the Sunni Muslims. The green is the Shia Muslims. Now they hate each other with a passion. They have a different imam. They don't like each other. They're, they've basically been at spiritual warfare for centuries. And of course, they're now getting hotted up because Iran is 100% Shia. Next door, Iraq is 60% Shia. The rest of the Middle East is basically Sunni. Saudi Arabia is the leader of the Sunni movement. Now, why is this important? Because you see, what's happened now is that there's now this this warfare, this contention between these two parts of the Muslim world that has resulted in a change of attitude by the Sunni nations led by Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states towards Israel. Now why is this important? Because of verse 13 of Ezekiel 38. Now I'll prove in a minute that Sheba and Dedan is a reference to these Arab states 
Saudi Arabia, next door Yemen, which by the way is partly Shia, which is why Saudi Arabia is in there now, dealing with that. This area here is Sheba and Dedan. We'll come to that in a minute. Okay, so we've got this situation. So what's happening in Saudi Arabia? Well, they're trying to change the Arab mind. This is March 2017, about what's happening there. This, this Institute for Near East Policy stressed that Israel and Saudi Arabia face a common Nazi-like threat in Iran. Really? And said the Arab radio, Arab, the, the Arab mind must liberate itself from the legacy of former Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser and the legacy of both the Sunni and Shia sects which has instilled for political interests the culture of Jew hatred and denial of the historic right in the region. Well, that's been going on for some time. A change in the attitude of the Arab peoples here in the area of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. Now, this is going back to June 2017. Um, Mohammed bin Salman, they call him MBS. He's the gentleman who was allegedly responsible for Khashoggi's death. Okay, nothing's happened about that, has it, really? because he's very powerful. And this was a commentary that was made at the time, that the change, the elevation of Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who at the time was 31, quite a young man, uh, he, he kicked out one of his uh, family members as part of a broad reshuffle, is not merely the internal affair of the royal hierarchy, but a game-changing international event. And it was, because this man has turned it all around. So why does Saudi Arabia need Israel's support. Well, MBS used to be the defence minister. And when he was the defence minister, he was counting up the cost of a war with Iran. And he decided, it says here, he assessed his ability to defeat Iran in a land battle and concluded his forces do not measure up. However, with Israeli assistance, a joint force might prevail. Hence, the Crown Prince is developing joint military manoeuvres with Israel as his key ally. Excuse me. These nations, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, Egypt, Iraq and Iran, spent 70 years pouring squillions of oil dollars into the destruction of Israel. And now some of them want Israel to be their closest ally. It is, in my view, the greatest event in the fulfilment of Bible prophecy in the last few years. The change of attitude amongst these peoples towards Israel. So why did it have to happen? Well, it had to happen because of Ezekiel 38 verse 13. And it says this. The first to object. It doesn't say Tarshish and its young lions are first. It says Sheba and Dedan are the first to object to the Gogian invasion of the land. Why? Well, because they're their closest allies. That's why. And who are these Sheba and Dedan nations? Well, here's some maps. Might help. Here's an ancient, a map about ancient kingdoms. There it is, the kingdom of Sheba. It was here in this area. What we call modern Yemen. Over here, Yemen. Okay? That was Sheba. This was Dedan, this area here, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states. Okay, so Sheba and Dedan are those nations who are now seeking to make alliances with Israel. Here's just a couple of snippets. I could give you dozens of these. Here's just one. This is about Oman. So here's Dedan, here's Sheba. This is what's happening. This is reported October last year in the Jerusalem Post. Oman publicly called on Middle East countries to accept Israel after Netanyahu had visited there. And moreover, earlier this year, in, uh, in the early part of 2019, at a recent summit in Poland, Netanyahu sat beside the foreign ministers of Yemen and Oman, Sheba, Didan. And of course, we know that Israel is also working very closely with other Gulf states like Qatar and Bahrain. Amazing changes in the Middle East. These are the nations who want to destroy Israel. But now they want to make Israel their closest ally. That is required by Bible prophecy. And to do this, they have to change the mind of their people. So what do you do? You put it on television. So they're now showing documentaries about Israel on Saudi Arabian television. 
And this one got up the nose of the Palestinians. It depicts the lead up to and the creation of the Jewish state. The documentary reconstructs the story of the birth of Israel in a way that is free of ideology and partisanship. Now, this is what's happening in Saudi Arabia. And the academics are teaching this in the universities, many of them. Well, of course, the Palestinians are very upset by this. They talk about the liquidation of the Palestinian cause through the deal of the century promoted by the American uh, administration led by Trump. Now, I want to talk briefly about that because it's very important what's happening here. What is this deal of the century? Well, let's step back a year or two. This was reported in December 2017. This was uh, from a Debka report. The old Saudi Arab League peace plan of 2003, it said, was a dead letter. Riyadh, that's the capital of Saudi Arabia, has dropped its demand that Israel accept the Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. Since the original Saudi peace proposal, which the prince called, this is MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, he called Plan A as being dead, it is necessary to move forward to Plan B. So what's Plan B? Plan B is essentially as follows. The state of Palestine would be established in the Gaza Strip, plus large tracts of territory to be annexed from northern Sinai. And Egypt has agreed to this outline. So why is that important to followers of Bible prophecy? It's exactly what Bible prophecy requires. Now you see those two references on the screen behind me? Joel 3 verse 4 and Zephaniah 2, 4 to 7. I want you to come there with me. Firstly, Joel chapter 3. Now, Joel 3, like Zechariah 14 and Ezekiel 38, is about the Gogi invasion of the land, the all, all nations coming against Jerusalem to battle and divine judgment. In the valley of Jehoshaphat means to, the judgment of Yah. Okay, so we know the context of verse 2. Let me read in verse 4 these words. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon? So why should they be there? Well, that's where the Hezbollah are. All right, Hezbollah are a problem for Israel. He goes on to say this. And all the coasts of Palestine. Now, I'm going to stop there. I don't need to read anymore. Let me ask you one question. They want to make a Palestinian state in the West Bank. That's where the international the powers want to create an, a Palestinian state. True? Does the West Bank have a coastline? No. The closest it gets to the Mediterranean is nine miles. It doesn't have a coastline. Does the Gaza Strip have a coastline? Yes. Come to Zephaniah chapter 2. Now it's always important, as I said in relation to Joel 3, to know what your context is. So what's the context of Zephaniah 2? Well, we could go in at length, but let's just look at one verse. Let's look at verse 11 of Zephaniah chapter 2. Now this says this. Yahweh will be terrible unto them. This is the nations who have opposed Israel. For he will famish all the gods of the earth. So how do you famish the gods of the earth? Well, you take away their devotees, don't you? You take away the people that worship them. You convert the people that worship them or take them out of the way. He will famish all the gods of the earth. So what's going to be the result of that? We'll read on in verse 11. And men shall worship him, this is Yahweh the God of Israel, everyone from his place. What does that mean? Won't be one place on earth where people will not be worshipping God. Okay? Not one place on earth where they will not be worshipping the God of Israel. And even all the isles of the nations. So what's that verse about, do you think? Well, it's about the kingdom age, isn't it? So you know your context. What precedes the establishment of the kingdom age? Well, Armageddon and all the divine judgments. Yeah, they're referred to in the previous verses. So read with me from verse 4. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. Now, where are these people? Well, Ashkelon's in Israel today. Where's Gaza? Oh, it's in the Gaza Strip, isn't it? Yeah goes on to say in verse 5, Woe unto the inhabitants of the seacoast. Notice this, it has a seacoast. 
the nation of the Kerathites. Well, who were they? Well, they're Philistines. Where did they get the name Palestine from? Well, from Philistine, yeah. It's the modern form of Philistine. Yeah, this is the Palestinians it's talking about. We know this is the latter days. This is the Palestinians being referred to here. So what's going to happen to them? Read on. I'm not going to read it for the sake of time. Read on. And it will tell you they're going to be removed. They're going to be removed from that place so that the people of Israel, the tribes of Israel, can inherit that land. Which we know is going to happen from Ezekiel's prophecy. So you see what we're reading here? If there is to be a Palestinian state, then it will be in the Gaza Strip with additional territory provided by Egypt. And why would Egypt want to retain northern Sinai anyway? It's infested with ISIS guerrillas that killed off more than 350 Egyptian soldiers and policemen in the last few years. Why would you want to keep it? Give it away to the Palestinians. And so we can see that happening as well. But there's something even more important. So if the Palestinian state is not going to be in the West Bank, what about the West Bank? This is where you've got to come back with me to Ezekiel 38. There are two verses in Ezekiel 38 that tell us about the destiny of this place. Verse 8 and verse 12. Ezekiel 38, verse 8. Talking to Gog, after many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. No doubt about what land that is. Is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. So where are the mountains of Israel? Well, the mountains of Israel run from Hebron, 3,300 feet, 1,000 metres, to Mount Gilboa. 90% of the mountains of Israel are behind the green line. It's red there, but it's green line, they call it. It's got a wall around it. It's coming down. It's cliplock, it's Lego. All right? It's coming down. Because Israel is going to annex this piece of land. You know, the very last political decision made anywhere on the globe was made at 11.45 p.m. on the 31st of December 2017. While the rest of the world is getting ready to celebrate the new year, the Liquid Party was in deep session. Now, Netanyahu wasn't there, deliberately, because his party decided at 11.45 p.m., 31st of December 2017, to annex the West Bank. And in the last election, Netanyahu came out and said that's exactly what's going to happen. We win this election, we're going to annex parts of the West Bank. Well, eventually, by the time of Armageddon, they're going to have the whole lot because Gog will come down upon the mountains of Israel. Do the Palestinians know this is happening? Well, they do. This is in March 2019. There is your post. The Trump administration will allow Israel. This is, this is coming from the mouth of this gentleman, Abu Mazen. Okay? The Trump administration will allow Israel to annex portions of the West Bank and split the Gaza Strip from the West Bank so that it can be a state of its own. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas said on Sunday, the US will tell Israel, annex part, this is his words, annex part of the Palestinian lands and grant self-rule to what's left of the land and give the Gaza Strip a state so that Hamas can play there. You're not very happy about it, of course. But that's what's going to happen because that's what the Bible says has to happen. Do you see anything in Ezekiel 38, this is 1 to 13, that's not actually already in place or happening before our very eyes? Can you find one thing? I can't, which tells me something. We are a hair's breadth away from the return of Christ. And we can use the words of John because this is what we want above all things. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.